guys, this is Debbie Seidel Bicky, and I'm back again. And I have a special guest tonight, Sean Lindsay. Sean Lindsay from Burn Christensen. Harris uh, Burn. Harris Chris. Burn Christensen. There's a lot of and firms he have big is, names. Her, no, they need to have Lindsay on the end of it right. now. <laughs> He's a partner there at Harris Burn and Christensen. The Correct. Swedish guy, Christensen, S-E-N. <laughs> right. Anyways, we have some great stories for you, and um, we're just getting warmed up, so I'm waiting for some of you to come. But we just found out, well, we both live in Oregon, and Sean... Fourth generation Oregonian. Fourth generation. I'm, I think I'm, well, I'm kind of like second generation. I'm not sure, because right. my husband's parents moved here about 40 years ago. Right. And we only moved here 13 years ago. Well, we were uh, great grandfather, grandfather, and dad. Wow! And are all the grands, so they immigrated from New Zealand. Oh my gosh! Uh, colonial years. How fun! To the grand in 1901. Oh my gosh! What a story! We we found out that we have something in common. He actually did some mission work right. in Barcelona, which I just love. You guys who know me. You know that I'm a big Spain person. <laughs> I'm always talking about Spain, and I'm right. all about Spain. It's been right. my life, and right. he knows some of the same places that I've been. So yeah. I think, I think you've been following after me because you're younger than me. Correct. Correct. <laughs> but I, it's so nice to meet you. I'm really right. happy that I meet you, and I I thank Doug Aldrich, Aldrich Advisors. Doug and I are usually here live every other Thursday. Right. But Doug introduced us. And it has been such a pleasure to meet you, Sean. Well, thank you, Debbie. It's been a pleasure to meet you. Yes. So, Sean, I read a story. You have many stories to tell. But like I was talking to one of our clients the other day, and she said, gosh, you know, we're going to go out to lunch, and we have to lock the doors, and we're hoping that our patients aren't waiting outside the door for us to come back after lunch. Right. Right. So can you share that story I read about that? Right. That one office? Right, kind of a sad story. Um, we have a small podiatrist client, a doctor, who uh, they're, they, are, they close their office at lunchtime, right? And uh, the, whole, the entire staff leaves the office at noon, except for one. Uh, one of the, it's actually the doctor hmm. that remains in the office, but he's in the very back of the office. Mm. They leave the entrance open, and you come in, there's a little lobby, mm. little reception, then there's the welcome desk, and then there's, uh, then there's a door that takes you behind the welcome desk back to the, back to the sure. doctor's offices. Well, it sounds pretty t standard. Yeah, standard office. The staff, they say, let's all go do lunch together. They go out for lunch, and they leave the front office door open. They close the second door that takes you beyond the reception sure. desk. So are you saying that the door to the office was ajar? No, it was closed. No, okay. It was not ajar. Not locked. It was not locked. 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 Okay, I just wanted locked. to make sure because you said not. Correct. It wasn't locked, but it was the door was actually closed. Correct. Okay. And usually you walk in, you'll hear a sound, you'll ring a, a yes, bell yes. for someone to come out. So they left for lunch, and on their way back from lunch, they see an individual with a backpack who just walked right out of the reception door, saw them and then bolted. Hmm. And they come in thinking that was a little bit odd. And uh, they come in and go to work. And then they go back to their coffee machine room and they realize that a laptop is missing. And they say, well, this is odd. And they start asking around and they realize that, uh, that, that this person had come in brazenly. Wow and gone right through the reception door, went back to the copy room door, grabbed oh. the laptop and ran. Now, when the thief came in, the doctor who was sitting in the back office heard something and stuck his head out and didn't see anything mm -hmm. and thought it was maybe staff coming back to grab a purse or something. Sure. But, uh, but the doctor thought it was that and went back to work. Okay. Staff comes back and then they realize, hey, computer's gone. Laptop's wow. gone. What do we do? Right. So what do you do? And, and my question <laughs> also is, how did the guy know to get a laptop in that room? Right. Uh, we don't know exactly how the guy knew to do that. Uh, our hunch is, is that 
he sticks his head in, knows, seems that the door's open, knows that someone's people are gone, and probably just does a smash and grab sort of thing. Mm. Just wants a laptop. Wow. Probably wasn't going there with the intention, probably just a smash and grab, and someone that maybe grabs an iPhone or uh, grabs a tablet or a computer, which which are the most valuable things, and, mm-hmm. and grabs it and runs, mm-hmm. right? That's that's what we think is hap- was happened. But uh, the doctor and the staff rightfully think, well, wait a minute, this might have some HIPAA implications. Right. This might have some privacy implications. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, and, and and rightfully they contact us, their law firm, to help them know how to properly respond. And so that's what we did, was we helped them properly respond. This is what's known as a data breach. If someone steals a computer, uh, that, and that computer may or may not have uh, personal uh, protected health information, PHI, on it, mm-hmm. Uh, then HIPAA requires you, and not only HIPAA, but state uh, privacy laws also requires the, the person that maintains and holds that protected health information we, requires you to, to react in certain ways. Yes, and so right. tell us what are those ways. Now, we've got some questions. So I want to make sure that... Oh, they said our, our sound is muffled. Okay. Our sound is muffled. Um, is that any better? Cindy, is that better? Let me know if you guys can see if we're not muffled. Right. I don't know what to do here so that we're not or muffled. Maybe plug it in all the way and point oh. it toward us. Oh, maybe. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So go on, Sean. So, yeah, I'll continue going on while you... Uh, yeah, take we'll care that, of that. We'll see if that helps. We need a teenager here to help out with I that. I know, we do. With the tech, right? <laughs> Let me know, Cindy, if that's any better, okay? So uh, so what do you do? Yeah. And what do you do if you have, and, and you've read about some of these articles in, in newspaper reports. You have a, a doctor who travels with a laptop and the car gets broken in and stolen. Or you have a, a staffer that uh, sends and receives email or texts with patients, and maybe those patients sends a uh, insurance sure. identification number, right. or maybe sends a picture of uh, of themselves with a condition. Mm-hmm. Well, that would that would be protected health information. And what if that employee or that doctor accidentally leaves their smartphone on the bus or on the train? Uh, or, or outside. It's exposed and the data is exposed at that time. So what do you do? What do you do? Yeah, what do you do? So first of all, uh, uh, providers, providers that maintain PHI, they have to respond and they have to do an assessment. They have to do an assessment of their own situation to determine mm-hmm. whether there has been a breach and uh, what needs to be done what what actually happened. Yeah. So that's the first thing. You have to do a specific standard assessment of, of what happened. You have to do an investigation internally. Uh, what happened? What was accessed? Uh, was there anything accessed? And depending on what you find, you then have to take action on that. Some of the, depending on what you find, you might have to report, self-report, to the Office of Civil Rights. Hmm. which is the Federal Department of Human Services, which, uh, which uh, polices hmm. HIPAA compliance. Uh, you might have to advise all the patients that, that their data might have been compromised. You might wow. have to send a letter to them saying, on such and such Jeez. a date, we had a break-in. That's, that's awful feeling to have to send your patients that right, letter. Right, you feel victimized once because you were robbed, and you feel victimized mm-hmm. again because you have to act in such a way to to respond to properly respond. Right, right. Additionally, depending if you have like well over 500 patients' data that was compromised, you also have to report to that. You may have to re- do a press release and notify the media. So, are you saying the number is 500, or did you just arbitrarily say that? No, no, no. no. That? There's, there's a number. That there's is the, the number. The, the okay, that was important number, to right. know. So to announce 
So, so notify your patients, notify the media, notify the Office of Civil Rights. Depending on what you discover in your assessment, you then have to take those notification steps or not. Right. Uh, the best way to prevent any of this happening is to make sure that your data is secure. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that because do you know about a company, um, Solution Reach? Right. We like them and they have something called Patient Reach. Mm -hmm. And I like that app. It's supposed to be HIPAA secure. Do you know about that? Right, right. So uh, there, there are a lot of solutions out there. Okay. There are a lot of solutions depending on the device that you're using. So for example, smartphones, mm -hmm. iPhones, Samsungs, uh, they now come with standard encryption. Oh. So if, if a device is encrypted mm -hmm. and that device was accessed, then you're safe. You have a safe harbor if it is encrypted. Hmm. And so most phones, most smartphones nowadays come automatically encrypted. You have to go into the settings and intentionally opt out of the encryption hmm. to not be encrypted. Oh, okay. So that's good. So oh, wow. if, if my phone, which may contain protected health information, if it's stolen, right. but if it's encrypted, then I do my investigation. I note that, oh, my device was encrypted, therefore we have safe harbor, therefore we do not have to notify the OCR. We do not have to notify um, uh, media, okay. et cetera. Same thing with laptop devices or server devices or, or any sort of device. If it is encrypted, yes. then you have safe harbor. So that's my number one recommendation is that all professionals, licensed professionals that maintain or handle protected health information or any sort of personal information, make sure that your, your, the best insurance is to have all your devices properly encrypted. Okay. And if you're encrypted, you, you're pretty darn safe. You're pretty Good. darn safe. Good. So the newer iPhones and even the Androids, are they everything automatically in encrypted? Okay, cool. Uh, your your uh, uh, notebooks, uh, oh. MacBook Airs are uh, not automatically encrypted. Oh, they're not. Your Windows systems are not automatically encrypted. And by the way, mm. encryption is not the same thing as a password. No, no, I okay. understand that. A lot of people, many people. And actually, in this situation that I, that I was telling, the, the doctor said, well, my, all my computers are password protected, therefore I'm not gonna do anything. I'm not gonna do an investigation, I'm not gonna do anything. Well, three months later, he gets a notice from the OCR, the Office of Civil Rights, saying we were informed that this occurrence happened, and therefore you need to share with us what you did to investigate. Hmm. And that's when they retained us to come in to say, okay, wow. we, we want to make sure that we're reporting to the OCR correctly. And we learned, well, okay, you, you thought that you were encrypted, but no, password protected Correct. is not the Different. same thing as encryption. Yeah. And so, so we had to kind of reverse engineer compliance with HIPAA by making sure that, uh, that his devices were encrypted. We had hmm. to help him institute written policies and procedures to be compliant with HIPAA, and uh, and candidly, uh, because he had not responded appropriately, he he was looking at a one point five million dollar fine Whoa. by the Office of Civil what Rights. What the heck? Right. So here he is. He <laughs> his office was robbed, and he did not respond appropriately. He thought he had. He thought he had. Uh huh. Turns out that he gets audited essentially later by wow. the OCR, and he learns that he's looking at a $1.5 million fine, wow. possible fine, because he did not respond appropriately. Thankfully, he retained us, uh -huh. and we were able to help him out and avoid that fine narrowly. Good. Uh, but it, I just highlight that as a uh, the cost of being a victim is quite high. Yeah is quite high. So I wanted to ask you, um, I, we use it and then some of our clients are using G Suite for their email. Right. And then I understand our server that hosts our website and where our ma email comes in from, I understand it's encrypted. Right. Do you know about that? Right. So if you use an external web service such as G Suite, uh -huh. Google, uh, Microsoft, etc., 
they represent to users that they are encrypted. Okay. And of course, they're big targets for being hacked. Yes. Right? Um, and so they, they have serious uh, data protection uh, protocol in place. Okay. And they represent to you that they are secure and safe. And that's fine to rely on those representations. Oh, it is. With G Suite okay. with them. Now, uh, that's different if you're using a different service. You have, to, you have to do some research on the service that you're using. If you're using a local provider that has a server based in their basement, no, we don't then, use that. Then, then you need to be careful no. with that. And we you, have a, 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 may, a, a huge company that is our server. Right. And then our, that they host our website and our email right. comes from that server. I guess that's how you say it. I don't know this yeah. technology. Usually the, usually the server is hosted usually using shared server service in the cloud. Yes. Uh, on, a, on an external site. Like it's a famous company. You would right. know the company. Right. And that's where our website's hosted and our email comes there. But then it transfers through G Suite. Correct. So Correct. we use G Suite right. to get our email. Right, right. And so yes, you if, if you are a professional, licensed professional, uh, using that server, it's usually safe to do that. Good. It's very safe to do that because also they'll make representations to you and often you can enter into what's called a business associate agreement, uh, a BAA. Anybody that, um, if you're a licensed professional, you're usually not maintaining all that information yourself. You're usually using an EagleSoft or you're usually using some sort of external sure. third party that operates and manages that information for oh, you. Oh, okay, so right. they're practice management software. Practice management software, okay. correct. And, uh, and, and so consequently, uh, you as a pr practitioner bring a patient in and you're logging something into your system, but that system is automatically up to the cloud, mm. and you physically are not maintaining any of that protected health information on your local drive, on your local server, it's hopefully all in the cloud. Hmm. And with that, with that server or that third-party service, practice management service, is maintaining for you. And in that instance, the business associates that maintain it, they have the same responsibility, the same liability, as the practitioner does under HIPAA. Okay, so. When you do sign up with a service, for example, if you use EagleSoft or a practice management solution with, with, uh, with, with Patterson or something like that, you will want to enter into a separate contract with them called a Business Associate Agreement, or a BAA, mm. which says they will maintain your patient's PHI properly, mm. that they will indemnify and hold you harmless, should they be hacked, hmm. that they will respond appropriately for you. And, and that's important. That's important. In fact, I'll tell another story if that's okay. Yeah, yeah I, but I want to, before we go on, I want to ask you a question. <laughs> About that situation, what did the thief, like, was there any damage done to their patients? I'm curious. There was not. There oh, was not okay. any damage done to the patients. We had to, uh, the, they properly reported it to the, to the, Law enforcement officials, uh -huh. okay. Law enforcement opened up a criminal action, found the thief, prosecuted they him. They did find the thief? Fi found the thief, prosecuted him, right? Wow. But the damage was done. But we did have to, we did have to put policies and procedures in place, written policies and procedures in place for the, uh, for the professional's office. We had to train the staff. We had to appoint a, uh, uh, a privacy official in that office because they were not HIPAA compliant and because the OCR came in and audited we had to get them compliant before they responded to the OCR wow. because they would oh have issued fines for sure. not being compliant. Wow, that, but that's... none of the patients, none of it was compromised. Good. Uh, we did have to put the patients on notice and we did have to provide credit monitoring to those patients. You, the doctor did? The doctors had to pay for credit wow. monitoring for a certain time, wow. but none of the patient's data was actually compromised. That cost the doctor a lot of money, right. even though they didn't pay the 1.5. That was a lot of money. Right. right. 
several thousands of dollars attorney fees, uh, third party fees, mail fees to, to print and mail out notifications. Wow. Significant amount of money. Now, there is cyber insurance out there. Oh, <laughs> uh, I never thought about uh, that. A lot, it's a new popular product. Usually, these costs to respond to a data breach used to be covered by your CGL policy. Your, your your standard insurance. Okay. But now those CGL policies specifically exclude data breaches from those policies. So you're on your own on that it's, unless unless you have a cyber insurance policy. I wow. would say cyber insurance policies, the premium, an annual premium, is usually twelve hundred to thirteen hundred dollars a year. Jeez. They usually have a thousand dollar deductible, but hmm. if you have a data breach then you can turn it over to your insurance, your cyber insurance company, wow. and they will pay attorney fees. They'll pay the money it, it costs you to properly respond to a breach. Gosh, this reminds me of now you have to get earthquake insurance <laughs> and flood insurance. Now you have to get cyber insurance. Right, right. Okay, so anyways, thank you for answering that question. I was thinking about yeah. that, and maybe somebody else was wondering what happened to the patients as well. So tell us yeah. the other story. So right, so uh, uh, the the other story is a, a dentist. In this case, dentist purchases a practice, uh, but the person that the dentist um, well, let me back up a little bit. The dentist purchases a practice, and when he came in, he received the patient records from the selling dentist. Well, okay. that's what normally happens. It normally right? happens, right? <laughs> He receives the patient records electronically on a disc. Oh. Okay. Okay. So then the buying dentist comes in and takes the discs and loads it onto his hard drive. Okay. Okay. Then the buying dentist, now maintaining the files, contracts with a practice management solution provider and they convert the hard drive data that's on the drive. Sure. Onto the, the third party's computers. So I just system. want to make sure I understand. So are you saying, so the guy buys the practice. Right. And did he buy, like the guy, say this dentist, maybe he's 65 years old. He leases an office space. And then this other younger doctor comes and buys. Did he just buy the patients or buy the practice that had the patients? Right, that's a that's an even deeper legal conversation. He bought the assets of the selling dentist, uh, but this is a good point. You can, and this is a legal point. If you are trying to sell your practice, you cannot sell uh, patient records uh, because it is a violation of HIPAA. Okay. So if you're doing a stock sale, that's okay. But if you're doing an asset sale, it violates HIPAA. So this is super super important. Because we actually had, um, oh my, I guess I'm tired, Rod, um, do you know Rod, um, he's one of the guys who sells dental practices, do you know Rod? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So we had him on a Facebook Live, and we were talking about how many, there's this big baby boomer population that's retiring, and a lot of offices are up for sale. So they sell the office, and then those doctors are hiring us to be their consultant. And they're like 32, 33, 34, 35 years of age. Right. They bought, not only they're leasing the place, they got the equipment, but they have the patient files. Right. So, for example, one of our clients had computer age is a practice management software. Now they transferred all that computer age information onto Open Dental. Right. And what I didn't know until I met you was that's not legal. That's right. Nobody is talking about this. It, it If you do it right, it's legal. Let okay. me put it that way. So let's hear how we need to right. do it right because we have so many young doctors now right. that are calling us. Right. And I did not know this. I need to actually right. introduce you to them. Right, right. I appreciate that. You're welcome. So if you are selling your practice or if you're buying the practice, if the contract says the selling dentist sells and transmit, transmits and assigns the patient records to the buying dentist, that violates HIPAA. That's a violation of HIPAA. Huh. But what you do instead, this is how you get around that HIPAA violation. The selling dentist irrevocably appoints 
the buying dentist or the buying practitioner, if we're not talking, because this is physicians, doctors, dentists, podiatrists, orthos, anybody, okay. any licensed professional, the selling professional appoints the buying professional irrevocably as the custodian of records. Okay. And so the, the buyer take, takes possession of the records and maintains the records and is the custodian of the records and it's irrevocable that custodian of record appointment. Okay. And then the seller and the buyer enter into a business associate agreement that the buyer will maintain those records and also the seller wants at least seven years access to those records for malpractice concerns that might arise. But as the buyer sees these new patients and as the patients come in individually, the buyer should have those patients individually sign a document authorizing the transfer of the patient records from the irrevocable custodian to the buyer individually. It's a little bit of a uh, loophole and a little bit of a technical workaround, but it's the right way to not get in trouble with oh. OCR. So do you, when you sell, because you also help sell the dental practice, right. do you provide those forms for the patients to sign? Right. You do? Right. right. Good. Right. That's good to know because right. I've never seen those before. Right. That's what we do as, as transition attorneys okay. is we, pre we prepare the purchase and sale agreement, mm -hmm. we, purchase, we prepare the BAA, we pre prepare the bill of sale, we prepare the, and the purchase and sale agreement appoints the buyer as the, uh, irrevocably as the custodian of the record. Uh, and uh, and we, yes, we take care of all that, including the documents and including the HIPAA policies and procedures for the, for the professional so they can do what they do, and that okay. is provide professional services. The lawyers would take care of the nitty gritty, uh, eye glazing legal documents. So I think the important thing here is that when you are buying a practice doctor, you don't really own the patients unless you have this irrevocable contract. Right, right. And that's the key point right. that I wanted people to know. Right. You are buying the, the contact list, which is, which is uh, confidential. Okay. You are buying, the, meaning the, the database of the, of the patient's name and contact information, email. Okay. You are buying the assets of the practice, the equipment, the furniture. Yes. You are buying uh, the goodwill, but you are not buying the physical possession of the patient records, the patient charts you are being appointed as the custodian of those charts. And then as the patients come individually, then you have them authorize the transfer of those charts to you individually. And that way you don't violate HIPAA. Okay. And that gets back to my story if you want to get back to that. Yeah, one. yeah, please. Okay, so we're going back to our story. This buying dentist transfer has, has ownership and control of those patient records and signs up for a practice management software. And the practice management software comes in as a third party and converts sure. that data to their cloud, sucks it up into the cloud, uh -huh. okay? Well, that third party practice management solution provider, they get hacked. Oh, no. Okay, they get hacked and they do an investigation on their own system and then they come and tell our dentist, the buying dentist, who used them, saying, sorry, the patient information that we took from you and put on our system was compromised, and you are now on your own Whoa. to resolve that. So obviously, this dentist was quite ticked off sure. because he was relying on the expertise of this third-party provider, and the third-party provider left them hanging. Thankfully, they had a business associate agreement with the third party provider. Oh, good. Yeah, they tried to get out of it, but we were able, our office was able to enforce that BAA to have the third party provider indemnify and hold harmless our dentist. Wow. Uh, but, and part of that was responding appropriately to, uh, to the OCR and to the patients. So they had good. to send out 2,000 mailers to 2,000 patients. Wow had to notify 
the Oregon Department of Justice had to notify the Office of Civil Rights, had to notify the media. Wow. And that's a lot of money that the third party provider tried to pass on to the dentist. We were able to uh, compel the, uh, the third party provider to pay for that. Uh, but still that practitioner still had a significant amount of money out of pocket oh my God. because of the third party made that mistake. So if you are using a third party provider, you also want to make sure that, that your agreement with them is, is, is hardened. So when you're talking about this, you're talking about, let's, I mean, we got to say who we're talking about to be specific. We're talking about Kerr, we're talking about Dentrix, we're talking about practice works. Patterson. Which is, um, yeah, all of, uh, soft end, right? Computer age, open dental. If I didn't say that one, all those there are dozens of them, and they have got to have those. You have to get those contracts, right? I've never ever heard about this until I met you. Right, right. It's a, it's a, it's a whole new. Um, not new, not new. I mean, privacy is a big issue nowadays. Of we hear, course. we hear of Target. We hear of Evernote. Yes. We hear of, of uh, it seems like every three months there's a significant multi-million uh, database that is breached. Experian. Oh, yeah. uh, seems like uh, I get notified every once in a while and they have a data breach and they have to respond appropriately. Yeah. And it, it, it's the day and age that we live in with hackers. And who would have thought that your dental practice management software could put you in a situation where you're sinking in your business because it's $1.5 million. Right. It could be up to that if you don't have the correct policies and procedures in place. Correct. Or, and if you don't respond appropriately to a hack. Yeah. And, uh, and, and when I say hack, that's an intentional hack that someone comes in and penetrates your system electronically, or it's you leaving your laptop in your car and your car is broken into. Wow. Or it's you leaving your tablet accidentally on a train or on the beach. I've mm -hmm. heard of that. I had a dentist, or no, it was a physician that went to Hawaii on vacation mm. and was just working on the beach. Shouldn't be working at the beach, by the way, but was working at the beach on the computer and walked off and left the computer on the beach. Well, now they have to respond appropriately because oh they don't know who accessed that. And by the way, I should say, one of the reasons uh, protected health information on the black market, each data file is worth about five hundred dollars on the Seriously? black market. Seriously, each data file, each patient record, what the heck, is about five hundred dollars on the black market. So, so licensed professionals are serious targets for hacks. So, yeah, people are getting hacked all the time. You have computer uh, government. I mean, you get the whole government hacks all the time, but patient record charts are the most uh, expensive on the black market. Wow. So if anybody gets access to a patient chart, if they if they get 2,000 patient records, that's 2,000 times 500 on the black market. That's serious money, and that's why uh, licensed professionals are such targets. Wow. You know, um, I don't know how long we've been talking here. Oh, about almost 40 minutes. This has been interesting for me and I hope it is for our people watching. I'm going to see if we have any questions. But I, I'm i sitting here fascinated by everything I'm learning from you and I think I would like for you to, we'll give you lunch, but I think you need to do a training with our team. Right. Okay. We'll do it. You know, we're traveling and I almost <laughs> left my laptop on a plane recently. Right. Almost, right. you know, it, I don't know. I, uh, so of course, some nice passenger tapped me and said, hey, right. don't forget, you know, and right. I, of course, got it right away, but it happens. And, right. and I've talked to my colleagues who are consultants. One of them lost his phone. He's a dentist and a speaker and lost his cell phone for a day. Right. And he's a dentist. Right, right. So... Uh, and you need to respond, and you need to you need to put it in writing your investigation only if you're ever audited. If if you're encrypted, and you lose your phone, you can just write a note to your memo saying, "I did an investigation. I lost my phone on this date. I was never able to recover it, but I it was encrypted, 
therefore there is no risk that the patient's data was compromised mm. and therefore I need to not I do not need to contact the patients I do not need to contact the OCR and you make that uh, assessment in writing and you put it in your file oh okay yeah that's all you have to do he so got you yeah. so the safest safest route is make sure everything's encrypted I think we ought to talk about what is protective health information. Yes, please What is do. it personal and, information? You know, we were talking about this the other night, um, and and I think some people get mixed up. What does HIPAA really mean? Right. Some people that are watching might not know. I want to see if we have any questions. Sure. So go, go ahead. ahead. So uh, while Debbie's looking for questions, what is personal health information, PHI, and what is uh, personal information? So PHI is a defined legal term under HIPAA, and also uh, personal information is a defined legal term under state privacy laws. Okay, so protected uh, health information is anything that has that identifies the patient, usually a name or a, f a first initial with the last name plus plus. Uh, anything health oriented, uh, a picture, uh, it, uh, if you're a dermatologist, a uh, dermatology patient, and they have a picture of, of something on your arm, a, a mole on your arm, well if it, if it is a picture of your arm and your face, then that's, I, that's personally identifiable. Mm. If it is just your arm, it may or may not be personally identifiable. If it's a unique scar, uh, that people would know you, you know, if it's the Harry Potter scar, you know it's Harry Potter, right? Uh, as long as it's not personally identifiable, then it's not PHI, okay? okay. Uh, so that's, that's, a lot of times we have to ask ourselves, well, I have my patient's name on my phone, but that's it. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not PHI because it does not include health information, mm -hmm. it's just a name. Right. Uh, and so a lot of times when you're making an assessment is, well, what was accessed? And if it is PHI, then you have to respond appropriately with, with HIPAA. If it is not PHI, that's the very first question. We have to determine whether it's PHI or not. Hmm. If it's not PHI, safe harbor. Same thing with personal information. You have to do a HIPAA analysis first, and then you have to go to the state privacy law analysis, wow. and you have to determine what is personal information. Personal information is first name, last name, or first initial, last name, plus uh, anything uh, financial or driver, like a driver's license number, mm -hmm. plus a bank account number, plus a brokerage account number, plus an insurance account number. Uh, anything that the first name and those numbers are connected with, that is called, that's considered personal information. And state law privacy uh, privacy laws require you to respond very similarly to HIPAA. Hmm. So, so I thought it was also interesting when you were saying that because um, we're not HR specialists, but I know that there's a lot of turnover in dental offices, so we're working closely with our doctors. And I, I mean, the doctor's like, what information do I need? And I'm like, well, you know, and Doug was helping. You know, telling us you got to have the the I nine, mm -hmm. the I nine, right? Mm -hmm. W four, right? Uh -huh. um, we need their driver's license. They need to prove that they are U.S. or able to work in the United States. Right. And those things, I would think, are also secure information. Right. That would be considered. That would not be considered protected health information, but it would, under HIPAA. But that would be considered personal information under the state privacy law. And so if you're an employer and you have employee files that have their names and usually their I-9 mm -hmm. or their W-4 Correct. that has their social security number on it, then you are maintaining personal information. And especially if you have that uh, electronified on your database uh -huh. and, um, or if it's emailed to you and your computer is hacked or you lose your comp computer, then you have been breached. Wow. And you need to respond appropriately, very similarly 
to like HIPAA. Mm -hmm. And so yes, um, if you're an employer and you have that information, you need to keep it very secure and you need to have a policy in place on how to respond should that information ever be compromised. So Sean, do you, are, do, am I interrupting your no, story? No, oh, okay. no. So, Sean, I think it's very interesting, and I want you to do some training with our team, if you right. would please be so kind to do that. Right. But I wanted to ask, how can they get a hold of you? Can you help some of these people? We have doctors that are watching right now, and right. they need this information. It's not right. standard, typical HIPAA, HIPAA training mm -hmm. that you're talking right. about tonight. Right. Right. This is not something I've, I've been to HIPAA training. Right. And it's not, I'm sorry to say, I didn't learn this. Was I supposed to learn all this? <laughs> you know, this is a lot of detail. It is a lot of detail. So how can you help some of these doctors here? You have, tell them about that. You have a free paper. It's not, no charge for something special that you've got. How do they right. get in touch with you? And how can you help them? Give them right. that information, right. please. So first of all, any of you are free just to call me, free consultation. Uh, I'm happy to take your call. And the easiest way to get a hold of me is SeanLindsay.com. And it's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Right, S-H-A-W-N. Oh, that's right. L-I-N-D-S-A-Y.com. So he's S-H-A-W-N, and then the Lindsay is A-A-Y. Correct, dot com. Because there are several different ways to spell those names. Right, right. Sean and that goes directly to my biography on our firm website. Okay, So SeanLindsay.com, that's number one. Number two, feel free to call at your convenience. I'm happy to take calls and just respond to certain situations, tell you, uh, just point you in the right direction pretty easily. What's the number they call? 503-968-1475. Again, it's on shawlindsay.com. Okay. And then our office, dentalpracticesolutions.com, we're happy to introduce you to Sean right. and share the information. I think that you've gone into some depth, which we don't normally get in our HIPAA training. Right, right. Now there's a paper that you, or, or some, I can't remember, it's like a program or some good information that they probably want, that you have like a tr little training they can right, do on your, right. can you talk right. about that? So yeah, if you go to SeanLindsay.com and on the news section, we do have, I have posted articles. I've, I've got a whole database of articles, some white papers on compliance with HIPAA and obviously uh, other transition things. If you're buying a dental practice, what things to consider, whether you want to do a C-Corp, S-Corp, LLC, et cetera. So I have a whole database of articles that you can go to for just some free educational white papers there. Uh, on top of that, we do, our office does offer a turnkey solution to anybody that wants to be compliant with HIPAA. Okay. Uh, we have, uh, we have a, 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 for a flat fee, a low flat fee, we have a turnkey solution where we will customize uh, HIPAA policies and procedures for you. We give them to you in electronic format. We give them to you in a three ring binder. We bring them to your office and we will give you, you know, a one to two hour training on how to be HIPAA compliant. And it's, a, it's really a turnkey solution for that flat fee. Uh, I, I don't know if any other firms offer that, but we, as, as, as we go around and talk, we, uh, we're usually reactive and professionals are reacting to situations. And I thought, well, instead of having professionals always reacting and not knowing what to do, let's be proactive and give them a solution that will protect them in 99% of the situations. And then also have a direct line to me uh, for any uh, for any uh, questions. So we have to have HIPAA training every couple of years. Does this qualify as that HIPAA training? Correct. Okay, and then Correct. do you give CE credits for that? Correct. Okay, yeah. great. So we, um, myself, Dental Practice Solutions, and Aldrich Advisors, Doug Fedick, who usually is here, he's actually traveling today to be speaking tomorrow, and so he's usually with me, but we are gonna be speaking all day here in Portland, Oregon on September 21st, and it's called Dentistry, Get a Grip on Your Business. <laughs> um, we're gonna actually walk you through a blueprint to get a grip on your dental business because our clients in 2017 were highly profitable. Right. And we wanna give you that blueprint. So I've been talking to Sean, and I hope you can join us. Right. And then you can share more of that information 
with the people that right. come? Well, I think that, yeah, the answer is yes. And I think that uh, professionals out there, they know about OSHA, they know about HIPAA, and they when they hear it, their eyes usually gloss over. <laughs> yes. And it, it's somewhat easy to be compliant up front. It costs a little bit up front, but then you're good. It's uh, the way that I explain it is it's less expensive to, to pay for a fence at around the top of the hill instead of paying for an ambulance at the bottom of the hill. Wow, isn't that uh, true? So that, that's how I see this. Yeah. So guys, um, thank you so much for joining us. Let me see if we have any other questions. And um, Sean, I want to ask you, can you write a blog for us? And I'm going to post that blog in April. Oh, great. If you'd be kind enough to All send right. that. I, I found it very interesting. Great. Thank you so much. And um, you guys, we're going to be here in Portland, Oregon at the Embassy Suites all day on September 21st and you can see Sean there again and Doug will be with me and um, we're going to help you to get a grip on your business so you can have the best year ever in 2018. Thank you so much guys for joining us and we'll see you again for our next live event here on Facebook, same channel. Thank you. Bye.